and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and with me, as always, is my lovely co-host, Lou A2A. Oh, I'll take it. I yeah. Like it. It's on theme. Yeah, on theme today, because our topic today is all about your mom's favorite compressor, the LA2A. Woo! Sadly, not my dad's favorite. What is your dad's favorite, Lou? The LA2. audio jokes okay okay uh and um yes so we're gonna go over the history how it works what it's doing and kind of the versions i hope that we can get into the versions and and the different sounds and tones that you can make and this is interesting because because it's it's such a simple compressor it's literally got two two knobs on it if you want to count the the filter knob, maybe that's which a we knob, hopefully but you need we a get flat into. Head. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> we get into the filter knob. And I don't know if I saw an exact page about the filter knob, but we're gonna get into it. Um, we're gonna talk about the T four optical cell and the tube amplification, and all about how there's a Jim light Lawrence. trigger. Well, Jim Lawrence. And uh, we're referencing a few different articles here. We're we're referencing classicrecording.org, which also which always has like great blog posts about oh, yeah. various different things. SEO is on point. Wikipedia, uh, UAD has a great blog about the history of different gear that they emulate, um, as well as a few other websites that if we ever get into. There's a lot of words, um, and I only like kind of like speed read through all of this stuff. So I might just like skip paragraphs as I'm reading. But the point of this episode is to help you feel grateful, to help you fe- that we have such an amazing tool, help you figure out how exactly to use it, um, what other people think about it, and uh, you know, help you plan on if you've been using it correctly or incorrectly, which is like, that's not even a thing. Yeah. There, I don't know. Is there a bad way to use an LA-2A? Yes. As a toilet scrubber. Yes. There you go. As a toilet scrubber. Um, and so <laughs> like, I'd be extremely concerned to see that. There you go. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I wonder if an LA 2 a gets hot enough to like, like, like make an egg, you know, hard boil an egg or something. I mean, it definitely gets I don't think hot, it gets hot enough hot. to be something to keep your hands warm during a cold season. There you go. So using it as a room warmer. Yeah, there you go. Like a, like we need to have like crazy AC, like tech server rooms. Anyway, yeah. um, we're going to get into this. We're going to read. This is mostly from recording.org. And Lou, stop me. And we're going to stop ourselves to kind of put some personal personal taste into this as well as personal opinion into this. But here it sure. is. They were from recording.org, the Teletronics LA-2A. The LA-2A leveling amplifier is an audio gain reduction device invented by James F. Lawrence II, founder of the Teletronics Engineering Company in Pasadena, California, in the early 1960s. Teletronics was sold to Babic... Babcock Electronics of Costa Mesa, California in 1965. In 1967, Studio Electronics, eventually renamed URI, picked up Babcock's broadcast division, including the Teletronics brand. Three versions of the LA-2A were made until 1969. The LA-2A was inducted into the Technology Hall of Fame in 2004. Well, that was kind of like, that was like bland, like, eh, yeah. yeah, that's cool. That was yeah. fun. That was, yeah. like, that was like information that like you read at a museum. Yeah, but you know, I, I do, as an LA native, I do appreciate the idea that- It's in Pasadena. Yeah. Pasadena, that's my neighbor. I lived in Eagle Rock my entire life, and uh, hey, I'm uh, what is it? Um, uh, Glendale. No, uh, when you Alhambra? reveal your location, I'm uh, not hazing myself. I'm. Uh, oh, doxing. Yeah, hey, look at me doxing no, no, myself. No, 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 no. So his yeah. his address is five six three. No, just kidding. <laughs> Imagine somebody <laughs> actually shows up to that address. Like, oh damn it! I thought they were like being kind of serious. <laughs> there you go. There you go. No, um, but the fact that it was in Pasadena, I didn't know that part. See, I always knew Costa Mesa because of Yuri. But I didn't know that Teletronics itself had started in Pasadena. I mean, so Yuri's a, famous for the 1176, so I didn't realize it was all in the same brand now. I mean, oh, Yuri's yeah. now, um, 
uh, is UA, right? Exactly. Universal Audio. Anyway, uh, the next paragraph says, do you like my accent for that, by the way? I did. Very, like, it, it did. Was, it was, was very like very- comically broadcastery. Like if I had yeah. to have somebody be the announcer voice in a Superman comic book, that'd be the voice. Yeah. So um, if you like that voice, leave five stars in the in the Apple podcast or Spotify review sections. Those do go a long way. I'm noticing that we have more five stars in Spotify than we have Apple podcasts. So if you've done it on Spotify, but you're down to do it on Apple podcasts, we appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, But here it is. The second paragraph. The LA-2A has simple controls. A peak reduction knob controls the gain of the side chain circuit and therefore the gain reduction. A gain control for makeup gain and a limit compress switch which alter the compression radio ratio. The VU meter may also be switched to show gain reduction or output level. Okay. Yeah, there's there's two main knobs. Yeah. And then there's like the one main switch yep. and like one output like visual thing for to affect the view. So one more time. So the the there's the peak reduction, which basically the higher you make that, mm-hmm. the, it lowers the threshold. Basically, yeah, um, that's not exactly specifically what it's doing. It's actually just feeding more into the side chain circuit, which we read. But yep. basically, it's lowering the threshold and uh, and compressing it more. Yep. Um, and then you have the output knob, which can mm-hmm. do the make makeup gain. And then you have the view, which can do like output, so it can show the output or the gain reduction. Yep. A um, couple different versions, plus four versus plus 12 or whatever the heck it is. I forgot yeah. what it is. Uh, um, the, ga- the output and the gain reduction. And then there's also a little switch that's ster- that's typical on LA-2As and, and similar uh, copycats is is compression and limiting. So it switches mm-hmm. between like a heavier limiting compressor, which compression, which changes the ratio to a little bit higher. Maybe we, as we read more, we learn more about exactly what it changes to. Um, and here's the next paragraph here. Compared to other gain reduction devices, the LA-2A is considered to be slow, and that's in quotation marks, slow in reaction time with the attack set for 10 milliseconds. Okay, now I'm going to take a pause here, and I know specifically that the exact amount of time is heavily based on the opto cell, which we'll talk yeah. about specifically like the opto cell later, but the same device can have two separate non-calibrated opto cells which has yep. different attack and release times and so i'm i'm, I'm gonna add here that it's typically set and calibrated to be around 10 milliseconds mm-hmm. and like some revisions and some opto cells are just not it's it's not exactly calibrated but um around 10 seconds the la2a has a sonically smooth character that has made it sought after by many recording engineers over the years Widely used on vocals, but compatible with all instruments, it is often found as a second stage compressor limiter located after a, quote, faster type gain reduction is used first, like FET FET style, such as the URA 1176. Um, So, yeah, I remember you've heard of people doing that. Serial compression. Serial compression, you know, like, and like, uh, which means you have two compressors with the same signal. Parallel compressor means that you have two separate signals and you blend them, right? Yeah. So serial compression, serial uh, manipulation there. Um, I don't, but anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's an old popular technique that I, even I heard about when I was learning about mixing back in the day. Like people would do like a fast compressor and then a slow compressor. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm not going to lie to you, dude. I do the complete opposite. I do the fast one last. So that's how I did it for the longest because I thought that was the order that was being explained to me when I first heard about it. Uh And then when somebody told me, oh, it's the opposite. I was like, I didn't really hear an issue with the way I did it, to be honest. I yeah, I do it the opposite. It sounded kind of cool. I like, I'll, uh, let me say that again. I confidently do it the opposite way mm-hmm. because I think it sounds good. Yeah. With the specific set of plugins that I use yeah. or the compressors that I use. To be honest, the thing I like about doing it the opposite way is it allows for a much more natural versus compressed and then gluing kind of thing. Because I guess the idea behind the fast and then slow is you catch the peaks and then you round over any remaining peaks. But I'm... You know me, I like things to be a little more lively and full. So having a fast compressor last is just like, okay, catching the peaks that the slow one didn't necessarily grab. There you go. Yeah, no, that's true. And and uh, yeah, for some reason, oh, excuse me. I just like the opto or, or the opto type, the slower compression that's more rounding it out. And then the fast one, I barely use my like, by the way, specifically the purple 1176 from Plugin Alliance mm-hmm. is one of my favorites. So I barely tap that with like a couple of DVs of gain reduction max. 
weeks. Yeah. Like I might barely do be doing, I might be doing nothing for most of it until like the main parts during the course where like hits like minus one DB. It's mm-hmm. just like, cause that compressor also feels like it's doing a lot more than it's showing. Yeah. It sounds, it's like really aggressive, which is kind of cool. It's all work. But, uh, um, okay. So how it works, this is now, we're getting into how it works here. The LA-2A is is a hand-wired tube-based compressor. It uses an electroluminescent panel together with a cadmium sulfide light-dependent resistor to provide gain reduction, which in the LA-2A is called the T4 cell. Now, that's the famous opto cell, right? Yep. That, we, that we now know. Um, the properties of the T4 give the LA-2A its unique character by making it an entirely program-dependent design. The attack time is 10 milliseconds. And, and, and again, back to the, what we were saying before. And the release time is about 60 milliseconds for 50% release and 0.5 to 5 seconds for full release. Okay, so that's interesting. So um, if it's yes. high gain reduction... The, like up to the 50%. So if it's doing minus six dBs of gain reduction to for it to go down to minus three dBs of gain reduction, it takes about 60 milliseconds. And then from minus three to zero, it takes about half a second to five seconds. So it's, it's yeah. extremely slow. Yeah. So it's like a progressive release. That's interesting. That that's probably explains why it's a pretty smooth. Cause I feel like yeah. release the release time of a compressor, especially for vocals mm-hmm. is like, I feel like very important. It's extremely important, especially when it comes to fitting it in the mix. If you think about it, we use the compression sometimes to actually get something to glue better into the mix, whether it be on an individual level or as a whole. But when you actually think about dual staging the release time, you can also think about it. Okay, there's a certain level of compression that I want for the peak and a certain level of compression that I want for sitting in the mix. Mm. And that dual staging of the release is actually really nice for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do think that um, that's amazing. Yeah. So I. I forgot what I was going to say, so we're going to move on. Automatic gain reduction is accomplished by the use of the T4 cell, which is placed ahead of the first amplifier stage. This attenuation is controlled by the amplitude of the LA-2A input signal. Now, uh, raise your hand if if this is starting to sound like gibberish to you. Um, If it is, well, let's try to explain some of this stuff. Amplitude is basically just volume. You can put your hand down now, by the way. Yeah, yeah, you can put your hand down. No, 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 leave it up, leave it up. (laughs) And, And I want you to to make a covenant with me <laughs> to never put it down ever. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't do that. Uh, uh, that's that's stupid. Anyway, this, <laughs> this system permits up to 40 dBs of instantaneous gain reduction, yet causes no waveform or harmonic distortion. What? So it actually retains linearity in its phase. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Or harmonic distortion. Okay, so the harmonic distortion must be coming in from just the amplification stage. Not it the has to then. That's yeah. probably what it is. The amplifier provides sufficient gain and output level, 10 dBm nominal, whatever that means, to be used as a... <laughs> I like how we're the education podcast. Yeah, we're like And DBM. I'm like, whatever. Yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> to be used as a line or program amplifier or for direct connection to the transmitter in the case of radio and TV operation. Provisions are made for interconnection of the optical attenuators to provide equal gain reduction in both channels when two of the LA-2A leveling amplifiers are used for FM stereo broadcasting. Okay, this is really testing my reading skills. The LA-2A leveling amplifier will produce essentially instantaneous gain reduction of over 40 dBs with no increase in harmonic distortion. That's like a repeat of the last one. No. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, this is, might be interesting. Compressor action occurs from the breakaway point at negative 30, 30 dB input and up to negative 20 dB, at which the curve becomes horizontal to ex- exhibit limiting action. Wait. The input increases an additional 20 dBs, but the output increases less than 1 dB. The leveling amplifier. That thus combines the characteristics of a compressor and a limiter. A reasonable amount of care in gain riding will restrict normal operation to the compression region, but uncontrolled output levels will be prevented by the limiting action. Um, Hold on. So are you saying that it's like the very mu compressor and it's kind of got like a changing ratio? It does. I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, so the more you actually drive the gain reduction, the more it actually goes into a limiting. And you uh, knew limiting. this. Yeah. You're saying that it's you knew a, that. Yeah, the LA-2A has always been described as a limiting amplifier. 
I didn't know that it actually like so it stays in the compression stage. I knew that yeah. you could switch to the limiting. I did not know that it can. So I think I more. told you before. I was the guy that like played with every tool and created every scenario in the studio possible when I used to just record in my parents' garage. The LA two A being as weird as it was, and everybody talking about well, depending where you have the knob depends what the ratio really is, because it's like this ever changing thing as where your position the gain reduction changes how it actually compresses and how much it's compressing. Yeah, so I understood yeah. that was the case with varied mute compression. I didn't realize that was specific to the LA two A. I wonder if yeah. that's a characteristics of opto cells in general, if that's specific to the LA two A. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, so it basically becomes 20 to one after a certain point, which is uh, a lot of gain reduction, by the mm -hmm. way, a lot of, uh, input. Um, that's interesting. So that's without switching to the limiting section. I did not know that. Um, this is interesting. We're learning tons here. Now, and to be fair, I wonder if that, like, if that information is actually practical, like me not knowing that has never affected how some like mixes sound. You know, like, but that being said, that's, that's interesting you to know. Use your ear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let the uh, the heart the heart of the leveling amplifier is the electrical optical attenuator, which is placed ahead of the first amplifier stage. The actual stage gains, uh, the actual stage gains, and the and tube operating parameters are not varied, permitting the tubes to operate at optimum conditions regardless of the amount of gain reduction. The optical attenuator consists of photoconductive cell, which is optically coupled to an electroluminescent light source. The electroluminescent device provides a light intensity, which is proportional to the audio voltage applied to its terminals. So um, basically the opto cell and the way that it attenuates the signal is that the more electricity or signal is fed into it, there's literally like a teeny tiny light bulb in front of a sensor that lights up. So the more signal it is, the more the light bulb lights up and the more the sensor reads and recognizes to lower the volume. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like this light and sensor, which is part of the reason why it's like slow because it lights up slowly. It's not, in, it's not an on and off. It's a um, basically an infinitely variable like dimmer light. So mm -hmm. it gets slowly ramps up, slowly ramps down. And then the center has sensor has to capture. So it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like this self automating, it's slow. It slows down the process on purpose a little bit, which is really cool because it, it's it's not a very fast compressor, so it kind of rounds out everything that we talked about before. Lou, what is your favorite thing to use an LA two A on? Is there a favorite uh, thing? Personally, it's always backing vocals. Uh, not necessarily the lead so much. I like other things on lead, uh, but LA two way on a backing vocal is actually really nice because of how it actually does that reduction. Cause like I said, being that it does actually help kind of sit things a little more. And when things start to peak out, it does that extra amount of compression that also pulls back on. You can kind of just dial it in on like individual backing parts. Let's say like an ad lib or something. And it does this weird pump thing. Where like if you th if that was audible on the lead, then it's a, just a little too much. Obviously, we're not trying to exaggerate compression on the lead, but on backing vocals, sometimes I like a really compressed backing vocal, especially if you're doing like stacks or something where you just want them to sit in a certain pocket, but you want them to feel natural. Optocell compression is actually really good for getting things to like squish down and stay in place. Yeah, I do. I do like it on backing vocals. I, honestly, I'm thinking like, what doesn't it sound good on? Like, it sounds great Kick on drum. everything. No, no, it is, no, no, can no, sound on. good on, on. Yeah, too. yeah, it can, it can. It's it's a little the bit more. Snares, it sounds really cool. Um, yeah, but the the kick gives it that Beatles esque vibe, where it's a little bit farty, just a little it bit. It can be, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's like I do feel like I use kick for like rock and roll type stuff, where it's a little bit more natural sounding. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there's very few things that actually sound bad with an LA two A. In fact, mm. I I remember. I sound bad. I think there's more LA2A. things that sound bad through an 1176. Like yeah, trying to compress yeah, like a jazz yeah. horn through an 1176 versus an LA2A. It's just squished. Yeah, it's it squishes differently. And it, you know what? I'm going to say that in the future. If any if if uh if I ever have to be like, "So, how's it going to the gym?" It's like, "You know, my butt's been getting better, but it squishes differently." <laughs> <laughs> when I sit down, the squish is different. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, that's what you meant. Not not your wife touching your butt it squishes differently. <laughs> it squishes differently. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm trying to find more articles on like the other ver versions, revisions of the LA-2A. So it's kind of funny because on the different revisions from what I remember, they did like board changes because like parts were not available from what I remember. 
Um, I'm sure there had to be like, okay, well, if this part's not available and we can't make it exactly the same, there's going to be some alteration. But unlike the 1176 where they were trying to like lower the noise floor and everything, I remember there being like, for instance, like the Teletronics uh, to um, Yuri, then Yuri to Universal Audio. I'm sure there was component changes and design changes to kind of fit their manufacturing process a bit more. I'm more curious as to like how it affected them. Yeah, I actually, I found a list of the various different LA two ways. And to be fair, uh, these are all um, revisions based on the LA two way because we're not even talking about like the LA three or the LA two. Yeah. um, So this is specifically LA two way. But real quick, um, brief history about the LA two. There's a paragraph here from Universal Audio says, as the development of solid state technology matured, Yuri launched more limiting amplifiers with with the patented T4 optical attenuator, but without the space-consuming tube-based circuitry. As products like the LA-3A, the LA-4, and LA-5 gained popularity, sales of the LA-2A slowed down until it was discontinued in 1969. That makes sense. Like, tubes, as from, like, a practical standpoint, like, tubes sound cool, yeah. but, like, maintenance is really high. You got, like, building them and circuitry around them is very expensive. Yeah, uh, Heat is a big issue with if you have, like, a lot of tubes. Um, yeah, like generate heat generation and then also like electrical consumption it makes like paying your electrical bill really expensive. Um, but it sounds cool, right? The need to replace your tubes if you're constantly leaving things on is also just such a big factor. Cause I know like uh even at our studio we have like the the tube tech, we have the lot in Eden and stuff like that, just different units that require tubes. And it's like we could technically leave them on, it wouldn't technically damage it, but it has a lifespan. Yeah, it has a lifespan before you actually have to maintain it. It's like your car. If you don't, if you go on vacation for two months and you don't turn on the car once, it also may just have an issue because you just didn't run it. But if you run the car every day, you're gonna need to do the oil change anyways. Yeah, you know it's oil it's change one because th- the the oil from your hands can ruin tubes apparently. Oh which yeah, is crazy. And yeah. then, um, um, but anyway, I like the LA three as well. But we're not gonna talk about oh, the LA three. I love this yeah, LA three A is great, um, and then um, That's but a anyway, great so vocal one. we're going to talk about the amplifier, the LA two A. Let me see here. Um, Bill Putnam's company studio, uh, Studio Electronics Corporation, shortly named Yuri. Three different versions were produced under the auspices. What mm-hmm. auspices. auspices of the of these different companies before production was discontinued around 1969 to 70. In addition to these iterations of the LA-2A, two reissues were put on, one still under Yuri, uh, Yuri and the other one under Yuri after being purchased by Harman JBL. Oh, I didn't know Yuri was under mm-hmm. Harman JBL. Yeah, That's it, cool. it was for a little bit. I think, actually, they might still be. Now that yeah. I think about it, it might still be, because I don't know if you remember, but JBL actually had their own compressor for studios. Does... Harman Group own Yuri. Let's let me test it out. Uh, let's see. Harman International. Yeah, because when they sold to Harman, that's when they came out with like the I'll dual channel later. rack unit compressors. I don't know if you've seen them. They I'll sell for like two, three hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a here's a list of the various characteristics from each version and how they change, so we can compare. So this is revision one, AKA gray face. The face plate is painted gray. The first compressor to use photoresistors and luminescent panels to achieve gain reduction, the T4 cell. I didn't know it was the first compressor. That's cool. But that makes sense. Like the first of everything, the one that makes the way. Becomes the, waves. the icon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Produced by Teletronics in Pasadena, California. Uh, oct- octal jumper socket located before the UTC HA 100X input transformer for pad uh, slash pre emphasis modules. That's okay. Later units, <laughs> we're just going to skip over that and pretend like we knew what they were talking about. Later units included a variable pre emphasis filter, the R37. All rear panel graphics are hand stenciled or stamped. Some units offer a fixed limit function while other feature a limit slash compress switch on the back. Oh, it was on the back. I didn't know that. Back in the day. Revision 2, a.k.a. the silver face. The faceplate is now brushed aluminum rather than painted gray. The Teletronics patent acquired by Putnam's Studio Electronics Corp. of North Hollywood. Hey, that's where we're at. North Hollywood. Wow. 
Um, the iteration had an added compressed limit switch on the back. The input, input transformers changed to the UTC A10. So the input transformer is slightly different. Um, where it was, yeah, the UTC HA100X. Now it's the UTC A1 A10. The limit compressed switch on the back. This this revision starts with unit number 384. Okay, revision one. In the late 70s, Yuri brought back the LA2A for a run of around 200 units, returned to the gray face front panel, which means that it's just painted gray. Um, Yuri, uh, let's see, the T4A is replaced with the T4B, so they replaced the optical cell in the revision one. Uh, a safety switch is added so power shuts off when the front panel is open. Oh, that's that's practical. Re reissued two. In 1985, 235 units were reissued by Yuri under, uh, while under the Harman JBL brand. This brought the unit once again back to the aluminum silver play face look, but this time with the Yuri name on the front. And now is the Universal Audio reissued Teletronics LA-2A based on revision one. So it's based on revision one, which is the gray face. Yeah, revision one, not reissue one, revision one. Um, released in May of 2000, move the limit compressed switch to the front panel, removal of user accessibility via front panel thumb screws. Um, that's the common one we see now. Yeah, that's the one that we see now, the universal audio one. So they basically made it a little bit harder to tweak by removing the thumb screws, and they, they made the limit compressed switch on the front, which I don't know why they didn't before. So uh, the amplifier changed from revision one to revision two. But that seems to be it. Yeah, like, so there's like the, yeah, that's kind of like it. And then the current one is based on revision one. So I'm assuming that it has the, back to the original amplifier. Um, it's interesting. I wonder if the T4B with reissue, I mean, the silver face. I believe the T4B is what you actually get in like the LA610 MK2 channel strip. Um, when you actually look up uh, uh, the UA channel strip, that's, I think they sell for like, what, $1,500, $1,600? Yeah, so it's interesting that the LA-2A now also is like hugely changed a lot and they have a bunch of mods for them. They even have different... different uh, yeah, uh, tube selection options. Even even in the UAD Universal Audio like LA-2A collection, the Silver mm -hmm. Face versus the LA-2 versus the LA-2A, they all sound different. For some yeah. reason, the Silver Face... Um, well, remember, they're hand-wired, so production quality and manufacturing consistency is going to be low. That's true. So, yeah, so it's just not going to be as consistent. Yeah. Um, so I imagine as it switched hands from the Harman Group to Universal Audio to everybody, um, it probably and likely just wasn't the same plant that was building them all. And material, like I said, from what I remember, there was component differences. There was, like, capacitor changes, resistor changes, and things of that nature, which... Um, I'm going to be fully honest, you know, on a, on a basic level, they technically don't have a sound on those things. It's more about how power circulates through those components that alter the sound. So it could just be that the way they were manufactured resulted in a change without having to do major notable changes to it. Like the T4A to T4B is a notable change, but I imagine it's just the manufacturing consistency that was different. Okay, this is actually great. I found um, an article. This is from puremix.net. We all know puremix. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Fab. Um, mm. and, Hello, uh, children. Is that what he says? <laughs> yeah. Hello, children. <laughs> really? I, <laughs> on top of every video. Like, I, I remember, you can tell how much I watch Pure Mix videos, I guess. Uh, I don't watch Pure Mix specifically, but when he first started Pure Mix, he was big on YouTube. Dude, hello, hello, children. Hello, children. Hello, children. That, I don't know. It's, some it daddy, feels uh, daddy issues are coming back. I'm not just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let me let me read this right here. Um, so first off, the general ratio on an LA-2A is around, it's a fixed ratio around 3 to 1, which I knew that. Like, I've heard the fixed ratio around 3 to 1. I did not know that the more input gain that it had going into it, it changed the ratio. I did not know that no. um, in optical. Anyway, um, so let's see here. Um, when the em So sometimes, especially in these plugins, you can find an emphasis knob. I know that I have an emphasis knob on my Comp 2A, which is like my favorite emulations. We've shot out 
Uh, Mixed Bus TV is also David from Mixed Bus TV is also shout out Comp Two A from Golden Age mm-hmm. compared to like a, a L, an actual LA Two A and like these sound phenomenal. In fact, no, in do. a lot of cases, these may this may sound better than like a vintage LA Two A. Um, I really love these. I love them so much. I got a pair of them, and they're kind of relatively affordable. So, um, relatively meaning that it's significantly cheaper than an actual LA Two Unit, but it's a still six hundred. LA Two Unit is roughly about four grand right now. After yeah, and inflation. then these units are six hundred bucks. So six hundred yeah. bucks is no small amount of money. But that being said, like for what the sound you get, like I think these are awesome, and they do kind of like this analog thing, which uh, I don't really like promoting too much. But it does have like it feels like a. It does degrades the, the sound in a great way that analog analog equipment does. Okay. Um, so anyway, the emphasis knob, which is also on the Comp 2A, that's why I brought it up. Uh, and you'll see it a lot on these plugins, including the Waves one, the UAD ones, depending on the version of the LA 2A you have. The emphasis knob in the default position uh, allows the full frequency range of the incoming signal to trigger the compressor. Um, as you turn it clockwise, counterclockwise, however, it starts filtering out the low end from the side chain. So in mine, in my the Comp 2A from Golden Age, if you start turning it, yeah, clockwise, it'll basically yeah filter out the low end. If you think about it, it would make more sense to do clockwise when you think about things on a spectrum. Yeah. So just yeah. remember, it's counterclockwise on like actual, true to the original kind of clones there. Um, by the time you turn it fully counterclockwise, the detector is triggered mainly by high frequencies. Keep in mind that the base frequencies have more energy and trigger compressor more heavily, so turning the emphasis counterclockwise, which is filtering out progressively more bass, results in less compression. I- interesting. Um, so he, and he talks about different ways in this article. He talks about the different ways of using it. So like, but that's just general side chaining. Um, Filtering out low end in the side chain input. So, by the way, uh, the way that LA2A works, I'm going to try to explain this as best I can. Some compressors, the way that they visualize it is you see the audio signal go in, like at the R comp or the R vox. You see the R signal go in. The more the lower you, the more you lower the threshold, and any signal that goes past the threshold, above the threshold, will get compressed. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way like this LA2A side chaining thing does is splits the signal. So at input, it splits the signal. One signal is going through the uh, the actual attenuation circuit, and the other one is going through the detection circuit. So what you're doing is, if the detection circuit, which is lighting up the bulb, mm-hmm. lighting up the little opto cell, um, what it's doing is it it's actually then the sensor unit is then being sent to then lower the volume, attenuate on the attenuation circuit. Yeah. So the side chaining circuit, which is basically creating the light bulb, illuminating the electroluminescent bulb or whatever they call it. The optical cell. Yeah, the optical cell. And then um, within the optical cell. Uh, so uh, you can actually change the side chain. So like you can feed the split signal and make the uh, the signal that it's detecting from have more, less low end. So like the low end in your compressed signal is is not going to be lessened. It's, it's just lessened in the side chain signal, which you're not hearing. It's just going through the detection circuit. So it's lowering the base which then changes how it's compressed. So now it's compressing based off of the mid-range and the high-end frequencies because the low-end frequencies are just not there as much. So it compresses based on the detection of the mid-range and high-range frequencies. So it's still compressing the low-end in the attenuation stage, but it's just not being, the, it's not, the compression is just not being um, signaled or created by the low end. It's not being mm-hmm. triggered by the low end. But it's still compressing the low end. Um, so uh, you can get more. You can keep that fat low end, basically, um, and not compress. Because the thing is, like, if you don't filter the low end, especially on, like, on mix bus duties, mm-hmm. um, it can really, the low end and the energy that the low end typically has. It tends really, to get sucked out. Yeah, yeah. Like, it makes it pumpy, you know? Yeah. And that's the, the LA-2A signature issue if you overdo it. it. It does definitely have an audible pump. So that means you can actually turn an LA-2A basically into a de-esser. Yeah, which is, uh, you know, shout out to Heritage Audio for always making interesting clones. But I'm sure you saw the tube Cessor and how it has a 5K filter knob on it. <laughs> yeah, that- yeah I, I saw that. I was like, that's... That was an interesting addition. You know what? I'll give you credit for putting an interesting addition. It's like that 
two hundred and fifty thousand dollar buck from uh from the band uh Wolfpack. Oh yeah. Yeah, how I made two hundred and fifty six thousand. Yeah, book? it's like you know, it, it, it may not be something that everybody's asking for, but you know, the fact that it's on the market and somebody actually put it on the market, you know, makes it an interesting item to keep your eye on. For sure. Yeah. And it's sold. Both of them technically. <laughs> <laughs> so uh uh on that note, I think that's kind of it for the LA-2A. I hope this was a pretty insightful. For some reason, whenever we do these like technical, we're just reading the manual mm-hmm. episodes, they're, they tend to be pretty popular with more downloads. Yeah. Um, we're hitting like record download numbers <laughs> all the time, like every week recently. It's been amazing. That means y'all are trying to learn. Uh, we must be What's some good? kind of entertaining. I mean, I, I don't know if I can say that about myself, though. Am I entertaining? I think you're entertaining. And I, I think more importantly to the listener, I think that we're entertaining together. Okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah. We're doing something right. But the more that we like feel like guilty about it or like the more that we like overthink how entertaining we are, I feel like we're getting less entertaining. No, I think it's even more entertaining because like- Is let's, this entertaining right now? Like it's got to be, you know, because like, let's be honest, how many people have sat there in awkwardness and been like in the same thought? Yeah. Don't overthink it, guys. Because we're ruining the episode by overthinking it. <laughs> you know, I, I wonder sometimes if I sit there silently, I think about all the times I flushed a turd down the toilet and what the turd you know, I wonder, felt like. I wonder what they're like. Yeah, I know. Sometimes I'm like, I wonder what that turd's doing, you know? You know, I, I, I wonder how it went going down like the barrel. Is it like one of those like water park theme rides for the turd? It's like, all right, ready, set, woo! Yeah, I hope we had a good time. It went down the the pipeline and splashed into its own pool with its friends. Have you ever have you ever done a turd so big that you named it before you flushed it? No, I haven't either. I wish. I wonder. I wonder if that's because I haven't had a turd that big, <laughs> or if it's because like, have you I'm seen? I'm not either? a sociopath, you know. Like, <laughs> it could also be that you've seen a turd so big that in comparison, you're like not big enough for a name. I like how this this conversation is just turning into like turd talk. Have you ever turd seen an talks with DK and Lou? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll sign off with this. If you're looking for a cheap option for an original T4 cell, technically T4B, uh, 610MK2 is probably the cheapest you can get one uh, with. A 610 Mark II? 610 Mark II channel strip from Universal Audio comes with a 610 uh, and a T4B cell optical I actually had that one. Yeah, it's a good it's a good channel strip. Like, it's a little yeah. dark, but I like it. Oh yeah, the Universal Audio preamps are are dark, man. But they go really well if you have a bright mic like uh the U87. I always have DS oh, you, issues U87 with U87s. On the, oh man, yeah. they could be started. Yeah, dude, I think having like one really dark preamp is actually super useful. Yeah. Um like the Universal Audio preamps, oh dude, the 610 with the LA2. Yeah, I had yeah. that exact channel strip. You know how yeah. much I bought it for, dude? I had a, I bought it from a dude that was like leaving, not even, dude. I think I bought one for like 700. Oh my god. Back in the day, like I had one back in the day, but I I You can't find it for those I numbers anymore. I don't know why anymore. I sold it. Did I need money? I want that that's my first thought. I wonder why I, I sold. I don't, I don't think, think I've used it. Brought it here. I don't think you came to LA with it. Oh, well, did I sell it before I came? Maybe I, I funded so. my LA with that. Maybe. I think you might have because I know we talked about you having it. Yeah, but the opto cell, the opto compressor built into that channel strip was was dope. Yeah, um, it was really useful. I mean, like any sort of like opto compressor is just genuinely just like really easy to use and practical. Like it oh, takes yeah. no crazy amount of skill to get a good sound out of it. Yeah, and I'm um I like tube compressors in general, and you know I love a Verimu. And if you guys don't know about Verimu, we have an episode on that already released. So go check that one out um, on the Fairchild 670, which both DK and I use. But I think it's something about how like tubes react to compression that I like. Yeah. I think I think it's partly that. Or, or in this in this case, it's not the tube. In Verimu, it's it's tubes doing the compression. In this yep, case, it's this the case, tube. The it's, it's just it's just the uh, the amplification stages, yeah. which are tube. Which I do uh, obviously. Uh, what you're alluding to is, is yeah, the harmonic distortion that comes from going through tube amplification is is yeah. is super nice. Yeah, but expensive. It's super nice. Anyway, uh, this podcast episode is brought to you by us, the Mixing Music Podcast. Um, guess what? We have exclusive episodes. Yeah. We have exclusive episodes, and they're really good. And if you've been checking out the exclusive archives that have been coming out. Once a week, they we pull older, older exclusive episodes that were only released exclusively. So we release two exclusive episodes every single week, mm-hmm. um, and we pull one older one from months back just to kind of promote the um, 
what we're doing. And we do two every week. And it's, it's dude, they're great. Braden does a great job. Um, I'm there most of the time. And we basically just commentate on these influencers and these these Grammy winning producers. Oftentimes, Dave Pensado will say things, and and we have the, you know, it's the point is just to open up a conversation about what they mean, what the takeaway is, uh, how they interpreted w- this technique, um, and how you can use it for your next song. It's very technical focused, and it's very practical. It's it's great, man. It's super great. I don't know if you've checked it out. Lou, but no, it's, I uh, have. It's uh, it's really great content. If you're interested in learning more about that, it's only four dollars a month or forty dollars a year. Just go to mixingmusicpodcast.com forward slash exclusive, and uh, yeah, it's only four dollars a month. There, less than a cup of coffee a month. One cup of coffee, and you get to support two of your two of your favorite bros, the Mix of Music Podcast. Which, bros. by the way, we will be at Nam. We're officially announced. Oh yeah, we're gonna be at Nam. Uh, come April, we're probably going to announce like a little get together. So if you are at Nam or planning to be at Nam, make sure to follow us on Instagram as we promote or join our Discord as we promote. Uh, like just a little, probably annoy the people at AutoTune at Antares mm-hmm. and uh, do a little get together of well, everybody that listens to the podcast, meet and greet in person. We can Reckon, ambush the booth. Yeah, you get to see how short I actually am in real life. There'll be an ambush. Although, do I do? <laughs> there you go. An, amb- <laughs> an ambush, an ambush. Um, do I sound like I'm short? Can you tell? Can you so, how tall am I based on the tone of my voice? I, don't, I have a pretty I high pitched voice, but you know it's kind of funny because uh, we were talking with uh, James, the artist that performed yesterday that I did front of house for, and he's like, you know, I have short people face. I was like, what the fuck does that mean? He's like, when I go short on a, people face, yeah, he's like, when I go on Zoom meetings for like interviews and all that, and then like we agree to like terms to, to like do video shoots or live in person or something, and then they see how tall I am, they're like, wow, you looked a lot shorter on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> What the heck does that mean? Yeah, he's like, yeah, I have short people face. I'm like, don't worry, I have short people legs. <laughs> don't worry. I feel like I don't seem that short actually in person. I've never had an issue with how tall I am because I've always You're had a thin frame. Yeah, I'm very proportionate. Yeah. Like I have a very thin frame, which makes me sometimes feel lanky. Like I I don't have short legs. Like I, I have like I have like proportionately long legs. Like I have, they're not like extra long like some Norwegians, you know. Yeah. But uh <laughs> I have the 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 opposite issue. I have short legs and they're also very uh muscularly thick. Um so it just makes them look even shorter because of their thickness. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But you know what? I'll take it. I can do some crazy squats. It's fun. Yeah, I'm I'm very I'm very like I have a thin frame but very sh- I have a th- I have a lanky frame but a short body. Hmm. There you go. And uh, I don't know. We're just like describing the way we look to our Yeah, listeners. so when you go to NAMM, you, is, you're a little more prepared to see this us. This is a really weird. I, again, my favorite comment, I, I bring this up a couple times. My favorite comment anybody has ever made is, DK, you, did not, you do not look like what you sound like. Like you look very different from what you sound like. And then they could turn to you. It's like, Lou, you look exactly like what you sound like. <laughs> Which is like, Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No I idea. hope it's a good well, descriptor. Dude, you, you you sound like you have mental issues. No, just kidding. No, no, just no, kidding. No, no, I, I totally get it. <laughs> when Jesus. when you listen to our tangents, they're like, Lou, "What I'm is just, this guy, Lou? S- Lou gets to master for like Grammy winners. Like dude, dude, he doesn't even hold a sentence well, dude. <laughs> anytime anybody anybody ever makes a comment about how you sound is now a direct insult or a compliment to you. Yeah. Because now that we have that frame of mind that you sound exactly what you're like, someone's like, dude, you sounded a lot more like, you know, uglier, like uglier than you thought. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's a nice compliment. That's like a oh. direct compliment. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, you sounded uglier. It's like, yeah, dude, that's great. You nice. sound, you sounded like, dude, I'm not going to lie to you though. When you talk, you sound like you've like, you like murder people. I don't. Like, <laughs> you you, well, you find it relaxing so. to tie people up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do on your free time? It's like you know, I just play with a knife and I sharpen it. <laughs> Dude, I'm, like, I'm a voice. That's just like Boy Scouts. You know, like, oh man, that's you just, hilarious. You have the sharpening leather all. I I just like the concept of you sound exactly what you you look exactly what you sound like. It's just like a wild thing to say. To See, if there was a little more descriptor to that, I think we'd have more of a definitive what they meant. Yeah. But like because there was no descriptor to go along with that, it's like, did I sound? No, handsome? I think we talked. I think we I'll talked on Discord. Handsome. <laughs> yeah, I think we talked on Discord with the person that said that. Oh really? And then so it's like, and then I think he like. 
he said like, oh, like in a good way. Okay. Yeah, in a good way. Well, like I was kind of hoping for negative. You sound like you're like a hardworking person. Oh, that's like really good at painting fences. I'm not. Just, <laughs> dude, have you ever painted a fence? No. No, that shit is relaxing. I'm not gonna lie to you. Unless you get one of those fences where it's like the boards are like overlapping in front of each other, and then you got to get in between. That's just that's just fucked up. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. lie. You know, I I think about all the time of like, oh, when I buy a home, I'd want this, I want that, and the funny thing is, like, I would really love one of those like power sprayers that can do paint. Uh -huh. And that's how I'd paint the house. I'd power spray the house. Oh, yeah. That may make sense. Yeah. 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 That it's like way. Spraying a load on the home. Yeah. You know, yeah. you got to spray your load in your home. <laughs> I like, what is this podcast turning into? Hey, how do you like, how do you feel about the concept of like either interviews or like, uh, it's, I don't know if this would work with just me. I don't think this is like a solo, but I want to like every once in a while I'll throw in a bonus episode called like mixing it up with daddy D where we're just like <laughs> the point of the episode is to just like talk about random stuff not necessarily audio I think it's a good idea it's like comedy I think uh, I think it'd work especially well considering the podcast style if it had some level to do with uh, music industry like funny stories and things that we've seen people go through like for instance um Never, well, I think it'll naturally turn into that yeah. at sometimes. Like as yeah. like it's if two like, people are on, you know. People. So like, what do you do with your free time? And then you know, you find out it's like, well, I actually used to play guitar and this and that. It's like, what do you do now? I throw guitars away. Like it ruined my life. <laughs> yeah, no. no, it's good. It's good to talk about music, right? Yeah. I For think outside. Did you see of Sam music, Smith's costume by the way at like the British Awards? Was he Smith? Sam, uh, uh, Smith Sam. Yes, he was. He was smithing his his, his Sam. Sam, and he was. Uh, <laughs> Did you like he was, my? He, he, he had, had like really think about it. Kind of thing. <laughs> he had like basically like leather blow up balloons on his shoulders and his thighs. So like his thighs had like his like the blow up thighs and the blow up shoulders. It was dude. It was like comical, bro. It was great. My favorite thing is when people go to those things and then they're like, "Oh yeah, I just wore jeans." It's like why? It's like I don't want to spend all this money when we could be donating it. Dude. It's like you know what. <laughs> How how awesome would it be to be just like I got the most expensive blue jeans I could find? Can I can I say <laughs> something out loud here? Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to you. Like I think out of all the awards, the Tonys, the Oscar, the Golden Globes, which is funny in itself, as long yeah. as Ricky Gervais is, keeps like keeps uh um you know being the host of the Golden Globes, I'm gonna keep watching, dude. That he is <laughs> hilarious. I will I will watch Golden Globes of just him announcing the next act. He is. Oh man, I love I love that kind of like brutal humor where like Tom Hanks is like jaw dropped and just like totally offended. <laughs> I love when humor offends people. I think it's just hilarious. I judge yeah. the people that are getting offended. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't I don't laugh at the humor. I, I laugh at the people. Yeah, dude. no, I, I'm teasing, but uh, 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 the uh, I I do think that there's. Uh, don't get me wrong. Like I hope the Recording Academy Academy supports the Mixing Music Podcast sometime in the future. Um, we're both members, you know, like members. Hope of the we get a Grammy for podcast. Yeah, there you go. What? <laughs> and, <laughs> we're but, uh, a recorded medium. There you go. There you go. And then um, also, I wonder if they have that actually, or if they're going to introduce that. Anyway, um, in the in the uh, uh, like, uh, that'll be funny. That I do think that how serious the Grammys are or award ceremony is is directly reflected by how seriously people take the dress code. So like for all of the Oscars, it's black tie. And yeah. no matter how much of a celebrity you are, everybody wears some kind of a tuxedo or a suit. Yeah. And if you if you don't, you're one of like the three that's probably on stage to make a point, right? Yeah. And there's like, but the Grammys, like I don't know, a si I didn't see a single person wearing a tux, dude. At the Grammys? <laughs> At the Grammys, like, nobody yeah. wears black tie, dude. Nobody, yeah. Everybody, like, even Harry Styles, like, in a colorful, bedazzled, bedazzled jumpsuit, which is, like, cool, but yeah. it's, like, I wonder if that's got any sort of reflection of, like, how serious an award ceremony is. Like, it, it's, it's not serious enough for people to take the black tie dress code serious. I think part of it is that there's always been this... Uh uh, we're like really ranting on some bullshit right now. Yeah, I think it's because like the Grammys have always had this veil of illusion that some people see and some people don't. And the idea of like, okay, cool. Um, we understand that it's like um, voted from within, right? Your people from within are voting. Not everybody's associated to every project, but um, a lot of people who don't seem to win consistently 
seem to feel a certain way where they're like, well, it's just people voting on their own projects. I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, wouldn't you vote for your teammate if they were choosing MVP and all that? Like, I'm just saying, like, that kind of makes sense. If I was voting for school president, I'd choose my friend too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't <laughs> wonder because, like, at the end of the day, I, this is maybe because I'm not part of the film and TV in- industry. And then we're going to end the episode, I promise. But like when, it, when it's the Oscars, you pick like best film or whatever, back to actress. It's like there's some sort of like objective. Okay, um, this was the best acting. Yeah. This was like there's it's based on the art yep. to a certain degree, yep. uh, to a certain degree. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to the fact that like Parasite won a couple of years ago. Yeah. It was like the first yeah. foreign film to win the final, the, the biggest award of the of the year. And uh, um, it was interesting that it's like kind of it's based on the art still. There's still yeah. like a level of respect. And then the Grammys, it's like, sure. Like, as it was by Harry Styles, what is like a phenomenal record, both like yeah. tonally as well as like the songwriting. That shit's catchy as yeah. all get out, dude. It's it's really catchy. It's a great song. But like Is it Grammy? But no, no, well, no, I think it I think it is. I think it should be considered for the Grammy. Like, but I yeah. mean, like, there's a lot of other artists that we know that are independent that made just as good of a song that do yeah. not get any attention so i'm yep. like it's it's it feels more clout based rather than art based yep you know uh and uh you know I, I, there's a level of how much sincerity can go into an awards show um without without like objective you know values like it's hard to make a re- awards so show serious 100 mm-hmm. percent serious and taken seriously if it doesn't have um objectives and, and parameters that you have to hit that are that are serious yeah like it's like it's kind of like eh, but i mean that's what art is music is it's like you know it's just it's super subjective i guess so anyway uh we're we're granting um please help us get a grammy in the future because we want to have clout yeah uh, um, my current clout is i have an intern <laughs> obviously there's more but you know my current clout is um Dude, this is a good segment. The current clout segment. Yeah, it's like, what's your current clout? My current clout. Oh, I'm teaching a master class. That's my current clout. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. actually, I wonder. No, it'll happen before this episode comes out. So yeah. it'll already pass, but we. I did a master class. Yeah, you did a master class <laughs> while this episode comes out. Anyway, um, my current clout is that my boy, Kaname, mm-hmm. he's been cuddling me a lot more recently, dude. Fuck yeah. Dude, he's a mama's boy, mm-hmm. but he's been like, cuddling me which is great daddy's boy yeah he's he's become i mean the younger one is a daddy's boy. like the down the downy kong mm-hmm. downy kong is my my homie with the extra chromie he's he's a daddy's boy for sure which kind of like makes me i wonder if if i should be offended by that in the sense that like you have to be retarded to like me you know <laughs> <laughs> it's like at first like if you have half a brain you know you, you can like great but once you got like full brain, it's like, you know, he's not that great. Yeah, but dude, you warm like, up to him. Dude, this guy is crazy. <laughs> you know, like you have to like be ignorant of my bullshit to like me like that, dude. And and dude, Kyo, little little dude. Yeah. He loves the shit out of me, bro. He loves me relentlessly. I'm not gonna lie, it was kind of nice coming through the door and he's like waving hi to me. I'm like, <gasps> dude, he's cute. He hasn't been waving hi to me, but like now he did, and then Oh, and I waved back and he, we just never stopped waving at each other the whole time I was walking past him. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. dude. There's, <laughs> I'm telling you, like, the benefit of having a disabled kid is mm-hmm. like, it's ethically, it's ethically acceptable to have a favorite child at that point. <laughs> you know, it's just like, if kind of, if my oldest ever asked me like, daddy, daddy, who do you, who do you love more? I'll be like. Well, who do you love more, dude? Like, yeah. <laughs> it should be him. Like, is it ethically incorrect to say that? Yeah. You don't, I don't love the retarded one. Like, <laughs> that's more fucked up. <laughs> that's more fucked up. Dude, I like you, the normal one. more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so bad. No, dude, uh, uh, the, the young one, dude. He's uh, Downey Kong. Because I'm Donkey Kong. We got mm-hmm. Diddy Kong and Downey Kong. No that's shit. That's the joke. And, uh. Uh, yeah, my my. Uh, anyway, I love them to death. That's my clout. Is is my <laughs> oldest one? The normal one's been hugging me a little. <laughs> the, the normal one, the normal one's been hugging me more, dude. And he's dribbling the ball, basketball. Yeah, with both hands. He was dribbling two hands yesterday. You know, it's kind of funny because like the 
weird clout that I have does not work very well 99% of the time, which is I recently got a Giratina V alt art Pokemon card. And it's. Oh, dude, it, that was that once, was gibberish to me. Yeah, exactly. Just the fact that it's like he's excited over a Pokemon card. Like, well, there's a small community of us that like really. Like I like that how you you're like comparing your co- Pokemon card no, no, no. love to like it's weird compared to DK's talking about his kids. Like, yeah, exactly. But being that's a my dad point. is like, less more cool than than Pokemon cards. I felt like it was the opposite. No, it is being a dad and your kid coming up to you is more cool than Pokemon cards because ninety nine percent of the time, if you tell you uh, somebody, oh, my kid's been coming up to me lately, they're all gonna be like, fuck yeah. But if you tell somebody, oh, I got a good Giratina V alt art from Lost Origin set, the fuck are you talking about, bro? <laughs> Not relatable there, there's probably, at all. You know, there's probably a Jeremy out there that's listening to this podcast. There this might far be like into a the Bob. Podcast. Yeah, a Bob or a Jeremy or maybe yeah. like a Susan out there. A like, Hannah. We uh, Michaela a, spelled we need, with we a need Q. need a less generic name. Hold on. Um, there's got to be a, a Barth- Bartholomew out there. Yeah, dude. Yeah. That's like, that like really gets into it. Yeah. You know, a Harrison. Yeah. Uh, a, I'm actually about to make a reel Joanne. today uh, talking about the masterclass because I think we have like, what, two, three tickets left or something, somewhere around there. And I'm like, hey, if anybody wanted to bring the teacher and Apple to class, you know, I understand that's common culture, but this teacher likes uh, Pokemon booster packs. So instead of an Apple, you know, maybe bring me something to open. <laughs> 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 I, I just want to see if anybody coming to the actual masterclass would do it. Yeah, there you go. Do it. I mean, you can at least ask. What is it? What is the <laughs> phrase? The 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 mouth. Uh, uh closed mouth. Don't eat. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Dude, no, I was not going to say that. Packs? I was going to say pizza somewhere in there. I'm really bad with American idioms. Remember my last one? No sweat off my ass. Yeah, yeah. Or don't make a problem out of a molehill. Molehole. Molehole. Dude. Don't make a problem out of a mole hole, dog. <laughs> First off, moles make holes, and yeah. moles directly rhymes with holes, which makes more sense. Yeah, but ant hills is the ant, phrase. Ant, <laughs> well, well, mole hills, right? No, ant hill. Wait. You know, like wait, what? Ants. Have I thought it was a mole hills. hill. No, I thought the correct one. So you're saying that the one that I thought was correct was still incorrect? I'm. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Now I gotta look it up. When in Rome, mm-hmm. you know, do when, as the Romans don't. <laughs> <laughs> problem out of a mole hill and a molecule ant hill uh, it looks like both are correct I guess why is your lawn okay no make a mountain out of a mole hill is correct so not okay. ant hill wait wait hold on what is the meaning don't make a mountain out of an ant hill okay both are correct but what is factually correct <laughs> Incorrect is uh, mole hole. Mole hole. Mole hole is is just incorrect. Yeah. And um, there's been a few other things too that I've just said incorrectly, but they like they actually they my, come out my so favorite naturally. Is like no sweat off my ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, that's my most recent one. But like I need to. That's when I started like writing them down. But I'm really bad with American idioms. Anyway, thank you so much for listening to the Mixed Music Podcast. Um, you love our ranting. Tell us. If you don't, let us know. Uh, you want to hear more about um, turd talk? You want you want more turd talk in your life, or or mixing it up with Daddy D and uh, uh, Lemony Luis? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lemony Luis. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for listening. Happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy. <laughs>